Can we say amen for what God is doing here? Amen. That means so be it. Amen. Lord, let your will be done. As I stated before, I want to seal our time today with the word. You know, the spirit and the word agree that Jesus is Lord. Uh, and it's important also to give language perhaps to not only what God did, uh, but also what he wants to continue to do in all of our lives. Uh, before I go specifically and expressly to the word, I do want to just invite and really urge uh, all of our uh, home ambassadors, but also our guests, please join us in prayer. Uh, there's an old revivalist uh, evangelist named Leonard Ravenhill who once said, uh, revival delays because prayer decays. Revival delays because prayer decays. And so let, let us not think small of those opportunities to corporately come together. Uh, thank you to all those who joined me last Tuesday at 6 a.m. in the morning. We had a great time, uh, but I believe we can, uh, we can increase that number. I think we were probably about 39, maybe 40 or so. Uh, I want to surpass 50 this Tuesday, 50. So 6 a.m., set your alarm, clock, alarm clocks and join us uh, for a half hour of prayer before your day gets started. Or for some, you may be ending your day if you work third shift or so forth. So, uh, but again, we invite you to join us for a great time uh, in prayer. Uh, also, we are soon to launch a discipleship campaign um, that will carry us through the end of 2024 and into 2025. Uh, we've been talking about discipleship a whole lot. Uh, we believe it is uh, part of the phrase that we say, keeping the main thing the main thing. And so there is a pre-campaign uh, launch that we're going to kick off on next Sunday. Uh, and it's related to the title, Kingdom Discipleship. Can you say that with me? Kingdom yeah. Discipleship. And so since, according to the scriptures, we are kings and priests uh, through the blood of the Lamb, I want to invite all who can and all who are willing to join us in wearing royal attire. Royal attire. You might say, well, what is that? Okay, well, I'll help some of us. Some of us, uh, uh, your royal attire could be, if you have African garb, perhaps, uh, that could be something that you wear or anything that you believe is worthy of a king or a queen, someone who is of that status in society. Uh, we won't judge you if you don't come with a certain outlook, outfit or look, but we do want you to participate, amen? Uh, because we're going someplace. Uh, we are people who are being built and we are people who are building. We are kingdom builders. And so that is next Sunday, July 24th. Again, all who are able and willing, please wear royal attire as we launch our pre-kingdom discipleship campaign. It's going to be exciting. You know, we got a lot going on here uh, in many different ways. Literally, projects in our building, uh, some things that are being perhaps retrofitted with respect to our organization. There's a lot of updates happening. Why? Because, watch this, we are building for the next 100 years. We celebrate 115 years this year. Our, what God has given us is big, you all, and it cannot be accomplished in just a few years. He's preparing us to go deep and wide. He's preparing us to go far. He's preparing us to do a work now that will outlive all of us in here. We're preparing, should the Lord tarry and give us history, we're believing God for the next 100 years of being on mission for Jesus among all people and in all places. Is that all right? So when we talk about building, building, you might say, aren't we done building yet? No. Because anything that has that measure of longevity has to be done the right way. It has to have great substance. It has to have great integrity. And so we want you to lean in and get involved as God gives you grace. Uh, please go with me to Genesis chapter 12. I want to read verses 1 through 4. And I prefer in this instance the New Living Translation. Genesis 12. One through four, we've been talking about things that are fundamental to the faith, fundamental as it pertains to discipleship. 
And I want to use as a subject today, divine disruption. Engaging the Lord's purpose for your life. And the scripture reads, the Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. Verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Father, we thank you for this word. May, the, may your power, God, be upon it as it is shared. May hearts be stirred, moved, and transformed today. May you get the glory as a result of the fruit that will spring forth as the seed of the word is deposited for some water. And we give you thanks that it is you who brings the increase. In Jesus' name, amen. By show of hands, how many people want to fulfill the Lord's purpose for your life? Just by show of hands. It's basically everybody. Somebody might put up two hands. I want to do everything the Lord has created me to do. I'm not just here to exist. I'm here on purpose for a purpose. Well, by the end of this message, I'm going to give you at least three keys to help you engage the Lord's purpose for your life. I'll say it one more time because I want you to be in anticipation. By the end of this message, you will have at least three keys that will help you to engage the Lord's purpose for your life. Now, first and foremost, I want to review our operational definitions of a disciple. And this is important, as I just stated, we are soon to launch into a very particular but fun and engaging campaign around discipleship. And for some, you might say, well, Pastor, you done told us this a whole bunch of times. Well, guess what? I'm going to keep telling everybody because repetition breeds memory, and there are just some things we just have to know. And so what is a disciple? A disciple is a learner, an apprentice under the tutelage of a master teacher. And we brought this definition from Jesus XP. A disciple is an obedient follower of Jesus. Well, this is not one of the keys, but it is related. If you want to fulfill the Lord's purpose for your life, you must first and foremost be a disciple. You must be a learner. You must learn of him. You must learn of his ways. You must want to grow in the things of God. You must be somebody who is willing to submit yourself to one who's been there before and who knows how to get to where you're trying to go. This is what Jesus did with his disciples. And what I found out is that in the pursuit of the Lord's purpose for our lives, there's something that I like to call divine disruption. What is a disruption? Most of us don't like a disruption unless it's something that helps us. But by definition, and thank you, Merriam Webster, a disruption is a break or interruption in the normal course or continuation of some activity, process, etc. A disruption is a break or interruption in the normal course or continuation of some activity, process, or the like. You know, we don't like when people disrupt us when we're watching our favorite show. <laughs> right? Some of us, if we be honest, we don't like when somebody's trying to get out of our row and they had to, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. You, was, you, you trying to lock in on what God is doing. It's a bit of a disruption. How about 2020? It was really disruptive, right? There are a lot of things, phenomena that occur in life that disrupt us. Uh, but let me help you. If you're going to follow Jesus, let me just prepare you, especially if you're newer in the faith, you will be disrupted. <laughs> there will be need to break or be interrupted from something that you consider routine, something that you consider normal, some activity perhaps that you prefer. There will be a cause to bring you out or you have the opportunity to come out of it. Now, I want to talk about something that I think will maybe hit home for a lot of people and perhaps give clarity now. Yeah, I, I, the last year or so, I, I've probably been messing with a lot of people's theology. I've probably been rocking some people's boats with some of the things that I've said. And uh, you know what? I like doing that, so I'm going to do it today. Uh, you know, I want to give some clarity perhaps to a concept that the world embraces, and that's the word faith. 
Uh, if you look up faith synonymously, you'll also see the word destiny. And destiny is something that we've embraced in the body of Christ. And I don't suggest that it's a bad thing in and of itself. But I want to help clarify the idea of faith or destiny. See, I don't think Christians should use the word faith. Because faith, by definition, is the development of events that are beyond human control. Faith is determined by some impersonal supernatural power. It is the idea of events being manipulated to produce certain outcomes. Destiny is the events that necessarily happen to a person or a thing in the future. There's a, a, a notion of it automatically happening. You people, you hear people say, well, that was, this must be fate. The problem is these terms are also associated with words like luck, chance, or fortune. Quick commercial, Christians don't, we don't follow fortune cookies. <laughs> you will be great. You will t help many. The Bible tells us that. So we have to be careful how we receive and interpret these words in the biblical context. I believe the biblical way of viewing this idea of how the future unfolds in our lives uh, more appropriately, and then we look in the Hebrew, it has to deal with mission or assignment or designation, appointment, or election. In fact, in Ephesians 1.11, Paul says, in him who is Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That term predestined has to deal with election. In other words, you have been chosen in advance, determined beforehand as part of of God's plan. Ephesians 1, 4, prior, he says that all of us have been chosen before the foundation of the world in Christ. In other words, it was God the Father's design to bring all of us into his presence, all of us into fellowship with him through Jesus Christ. It is a divine election. So that's a, a more appropriate way of looking at it. Why? Because the reality is fate, as it were, negates free will. Faith suggests that things are going to automatically happen no matter what we do. But the reality is, biblically, we know that the Lord gave us free will. God gives us an opportunity to partner with him. And unlike faith in the world's concept of destiny, it's not an impersonal experience. As a matter of fact, you and I are made in the image and likeness of the Lord God Almighty. We are the Imago Dei, and he has formed us and fashioned us that we may fulfill the things that he planned for us a long time ago. We have been invited to partner with the Supreme God who is personal, omniscient, transcendent, timeless, spaceless, immaterial, and this God has a plan for all of our lives that's part of a much bigger plan. And so our election is linked to a greater purpose. Think about Joseph. For those of you who uh, are familiar with the, the book of Genesis, Joseph was elected to be the prime minister of, of Egypt. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not speaking about election in our dem democratic experience. I'm saying that he was chosen by God to be elevated, to be promoted to a position of authority in Egypt, but the ultimate reason or plan was so that he could care for Israel. Why? Because God wanted to preserve Israel in a time of famine because it was through Israel, through that nation and through the family as a part of Israel that the Messiah was going to be born. If Israel dies because of famine, where would the Messiah come from? So what we have to understand is when we get promoted, when we get elevated, when God opens the door and makes room for us, it's not just about us. It's part of something that's much bigger. Let me give you some Bible for this. In the book of Genesis chapter 45, verses 4 through 8, don't go there, just follow me. This is a time where Joseph reveals himself to his brothers who betrayed him. He reveals himself to his brothers who abandoned him. And he says, please come closer. They thought that, they thought that he was going to be uh, harsh to them. They thought that he was going to be mean to them because of what they did. He says, no, come close. 
So they came closer and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset. Don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve out your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Do you know that God can take the, he can take the bitter things along with the sweet things and mix it together to produce his purpose? Oh, if you saw the movie Fences or read the play by August Wilson, Troy Maxson told his son, you got to take the crookeds with the straights. He's able to take everything and use it for his glory. See, the problem is when we, when we talk about destiny in our own interpretation, we only talk about good things. We only talk about the things that make us happy and the things that make us glad, the things that we want to invite into our lives. But we don't realize that the plan that God has, yes, it's a beautiful thing, but it's not just for us, but there's a thing called process. Oh, that if we knew the process, we would reject his plan. Uh, but I'm so glad that God is not limited in his ability to work around and work through the machinations of mankind. No matter what people do to me, the psalmist says, you did your worst to hurt me. In fact, Genesis 50, Joseph says it to his brothers. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. See, that's an example of the, the election of God. That is an example of the purpose of God being manifest through things that are good, but also through things that are bad. Can I encourage you today? Don't begin to lament because things go south in your life, because things go sour in your life. That's why this morning has been so important and powerful. Why? Because when things go off script, when your life has been disrupted and you are in the will of God, you have to know that he will take it all yes, sir. Yes, sir. and use it for his glory yes. see if there was no suffering how could we develop virtue we wouldn't need we wouldn't need courage if there was no danger we wouldn't need to persevere if there were no obstacles we wouldn't need any compassion if there was no suffering how could we attain these virtues if we never had to go through something see you don't understand what it means to need healing if you never had to be healed so I guess the old adage is true, no pain, no gain. Yes. I guess it's true. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. You're coming out. Thank you, Jesus. I love what Dr. Hart Ramsey says. He says, there is no one on earth who doesn't have a purpose with God's bigger purpose. You begin to fulfill purpose when you stop living for only you. Now, I don't have my handheld mic, but that's a mic drop moment right there. I didn't even say it. I gotta, I'm, I'm just quoting this man of God. But you begin to fulfill purpose when you stop living for only you. Let that sit for about 10 seconds. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Glory to God. I want to clarify. See, the church has in, 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 ha inherited and interpreted destiny through a worldly lens. We think about the things that, you know, make us great. We have God promise you greatness. But a lot of it's selfish. Let me help you. If we're going to talk about destiny, let me show you what your destiny is. Romans 8, 29. It says, for God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. <laughs> That's your destiny, is that no matter what domain, what place in society you occupy, you're supposed to be like him. See, it's quiet. Because we want our destiny to be the owner of a bank and to have a 115-foot yacht 
For a lot of people, destiny is equivalent to material things. But our destiny, our expected end, is, a, is to be like Jesus. So Jesus is the motto. What was Jesus? He was sent by God. What was Jesus? He was obedient to God. He always pleased the Father. He was the messenger for the Father. He was the Word made flesh. He had intimacy with the Father. And the list goes on and on. So if I amass a lot of material things, but I don't exhibit these things that Jesus did, then I have not fulfilled his purpose for my life. Yes, be in government, but be like Jesus in government. Yes, be in business, but be like Jesus in business. Yes, be in healthcare and education and these different domains, but be like him, be sent, be a messenger, be the word made flesh, do all the things that please him. That's really what our destiny in the Lord is. That's our purpose. Let me keep going with divine disruption. I want to look at Abram a little bit more intently. So we read the scripture in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 4. The first thing that the Lord does is immediately he disrupts Abram and Sarai's plan. <laughs> immediately, the first thing he says to him is leave. Get out. Following the Lord... And obtaining his purpose for your life will challenge your most important loyalties. He said, leave your country. Leave your relatives. Leave your father's house. God, you mean to tell me you're going to turn my whole world upside down? Yes. I have something different for you. Let me ask the question, are you ready? For God to require you to do something completely different? Would you follow him if he required you to leave the things that are most precious to you? Notice he didn't say leave your wife. <laughs> that just helped somebody right there. Somebody was thinking, see, I knew it. This is my decision day. No, that ain't what he's talking about. Amen. In the original Hebrew, that phrase is actually go to yourself. In other words, Abram, you can't, you can't become all that I created you to become if you don't leave these places. Go to yourself. You can't be what I created you to be if you stay exactly where you are. Go to yourself, Abram. It was an opportunity to encounter physical and spiritual change. So in other words, when we say we want to follow the Lord, guess what? It starts with the test. Man, out the gate, he's going to test your loyalties. But in order for the prophecy to be fulfilled, which was to come later, both he and his wife had to go. Change is required, you all. We cannot stay the same and fulfill all that the Lord has purposed us to fulfill. Why did he have to leave, Pastor? Well, great question. You see, Abram was not originally a Hebrew. The, the Hebrew nation came out of his loins. Abram was from Ur of the Chaldeans, which is part of the Babylonian Empire ruled by Nimrod. So Abram was born in an environment of rebellion against God. Nimrod, the Bible says, was, was against God. He rose up against God. He was defiant to God. Abram was born into this environment, and Nimrod ruled over an empire that was idolatrous. Abram's father, uh, Tira, was not only an idol worshiper, he actually made and sold idols. Now we get a better picture of why the Lord said you got to leave your country. You got to leave your relatives. You got to leave your father's house. Why? Because you can't fulfill your purpose in me if you are in idolatry. If you follow the tradition of your family, if you follow the tradition of your father, you will be in idolatry and you can't worship me that way. 
Now, fast forward to Exodus chapter 20. We know one of the first commandments the Lord said is, I am the Lord your God. You shall have what? No other gods before me. So he said, leave. Yes, sir. And for some of us, he's saying that today. Yes, sir. Leave. Yes, sir. Come on, you was waiting on your confirmation. Well, you might have just got it today. Leave. It wasn't a negotiation, but what's most powerful is that in verse 4 of chapter 12, the Bible says, so Abraham went, or so Abram departed. Wow, what obedience. Now, we don't know if he wrestled with it. We don't know if he struggled with it, but what we do know is that he did what the Lord said. See, when God requires you to leave something, there's a promise on the other side. See, it, it, it's not automatic. Abram had to do what God said in order to access what God had. Engaging your purpose in the Lord will require you to go against what you would naturally do. There will be a conflict. See, when people say that God is telling them all these things and all the stuff that God tells them is stuff that they like, they ain't really heard God. Because God is not interested in your list of activities. When you follow him for real, it will come into conflict with your plans. It will be a divine disruption. I like how the rapper Truth and Trip Lee said it. In the chorus, in the song called Price Tag, they said, we trying to show them that for Christ we live. Help them understand for Christ we die. Man, the cost is high. You're going to say goodbyes because part of you going to have to die. Man, the cost is high. It's going to cost you something to fulfill what God created you to fulfill. Purpose does not come without a price. So the question is, are you willing to pay the price to fulfill the purpose that he has for your life? As a matter of fact, Jesus made it very plain in Matthew 16, 24. He says, listen, if you want to be my follower, my disciple, he must first deny himself, set aside selfish interests and take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come and follow me believing in me, conforming to my example in living and if need be suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. It's a high price. The price tag is a little bit, it's a, it's a little bit much. <laughs> That's why some people, they, they, they say it don't take all that. Basically what they're saying is I saw the price tag and it's too expensive for me. So all of you who are God seekers, all of you who are hungry and thirsty for him, you hunger and thirst after righteousness, don't allow people to discourage you for pressing into him and going further. You, that means you are willing to pay the price. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Some people, they come into certain environments and they say it's too expensive. I'm too cute today. I didn't put this makeup on for it to run. It costs too much. It's taking my time. I got things to do. It's too expensive. I can't afford to lose this person. I can't afford to lose this connection. Oh, yeah, we got cash cows in our lives. What if God says, leave that person? Leave that business. Leave the organization. What if he requires you to go? Are you willing to pay the price? Many people in scripture were disrupted. They didn't ask for it. <laughs> but they passed the go test is what I call it. Can you pass the go test? Moses did. Gideon did. David passed it. Nehemiah passed it. Nehemiah was working for the king. And he got a report that Jerusalem was lying in ruins and it vexed him. It upset him so much he couldn't, it, he couldn't even get right. And eventually uh, he told the king about it because his countenance was all messed up. He was all tore up in the face. And the king, the king asked him what happened and he told him and he said, okay, what do you want me to do? The king 
uh, Nehemiah said, send me back. I'll go. Yes. Yes. He said, I'll go. Yes. Oh, man. Our, our lives get, in, they get disrupted in all kinds of ways. The loss of a loved one is a disruption. Come on. Now, I, I'm not saying that God orchestrates it, but it's a disruption. What do we do? Come on. It, it will necessarily force a change in our lives. Yes, sir. How about if, 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 a, if a, a family member is on hard times and they ask you to assist them? Some of us have raised nieces and nephews. You didn't plan for it, but maybe it was a setup by God so that they can come up in an environment that worships the Lord God and honors the Lord God. I don't know, but there are all kinds of things that disrupt our lives. Preach, Pastor. God knows where you are. God knows what you can do. God knows your capacity. Maybe that's why he's allowing it, because he knows you won't stretch no other way. Because one day you messed around and said, yes, Lord. One day you said, you said, God, if you do this, then I will. One day you messed around and said something like that. And see, God is coming for your yes. God is going to, he wants to see if you will make good on every promise you made to him. Oh, come on, fellas. I'm going to go down your street a little bit. Some of us prayed that she wouldn't get pregnant. Ladies, I'm going to come down your street. Some of you prayed that you wouldn't get pregnant. See, it's quiet right now. But we made promises. Lord, if you give me this job. God, if I can finalize this deal, Lord, if you open the door, then I will. He's coming for your promise to him. You know why? Because he understands what it means to keep promises. He kept his promise to Abraham. That's why he brought the Israelites out. So he knows what it means to make a promise and keep it. Will you keep your promise? The disciples were told to follow Jesus. And the Bible says immediately they dropped their nets. See, we think that if it wasn't spiritual, God don't count it. (laughs) That's why the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, don't make a vow rashly. Don't make a promise to God so fast. Because once you released it, he expects you to make good on it. Are you ready for this? Three keys and we'll be finished. Number one, dedicate your time or dedicate time to spend with the Lord. That has to deal with presence. Number two, learn the word of God so you can discern his voice. That has to deal with promises. Number three, obey the Lord even when it doesn't make sense. That has to deal with process. Three keys to engage your purpose in the Lord. One, dedicate time to spend with him. Two, learn the word of God so you can discern his voice. Three, obey the Lord even when it doesn't make sense. How can you live for somebody you don't want to spend time with? How can you understand what that purpose is if you don't spend time with the purpose giver? We don't give God our plan and say, Lord, bless it. We position ourselves in a posture of prayer to receive his plan. Psalm 37, 4 says it this way. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Many have misinterpreted that scripture and say, if I delight myself in the Lord, then he'll give me my desires. So if I want a Bentley, he'll give me a Bentley. Oh yeah, so if I want a basketball player, he'll bless me with a basketball player. I'm being a little facetious, but you get my point. We give God what we want and want him to bless it. It doesn't work that way. Because we assume that our motives are pure. We assume that what we desire by what we see is what God has for us. Everything that we ask for, and maybe it's aligned with God's plan, but maybe it's not going to come through the person or the thing that you think it will. (laughs) See, I'm trying not to go here, but 
I'm going to mess with you just a little bit. Ladies and men, those of you who are in singleness and those who were, you prayed, you, you, you gave God your list. This is my list of 10. For some, it's 20 attributes that I want in my spouse. And you gave God this list. But then you said, Lord, I want him to be a man of God. I want her to be a woman of God. I want him tall and handsome. God, you got to have good credit. Did I, did I touch somebody's list? None of those things are bad in and of themselves. But the problem is, God ain't the only one that hears your list. So the enemy also hears. See, Jesus says, I give you power to trample on serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. So the enemy has a measure of power. He can bring things to your life. That's how we tempted Jesus. He said, if you worship me, I'll give you all these things. So yes, Satan can bring what appears to be a good thing into your life. And that thing that looks good can become real gross real soon. Because it's not from God and it will cause you much pain and much misery. But it looked good, it looked the part. He's able to masquerade as, a, as, a, as an angel of light. And if you are a person of God, a woman of God, a man of God, and you are ascending in the things of God, guess what? He wants to derail you. So he'll listen to your list and say, I got the right person for you. And the problem is, they might even profess to know God. But they'll be a wolf in sheep's clothing. So you'll choose the wolf and miss the sheep because the sheep might not be tall. Oh, come on here. Oh, fellas, she might not have the coke shape. They they, they, they might not be at at the income level that you desire, but they are a true man or woman of God. They may have an attribute like this. They know how to cover you. They know how to pray. Come on. They have the right motive for what they want in life. And so God will cause you to be aligned with that person. But if you don't want what he wants for you, then you'll miss it. So you got to delight yourself in him. You got to spend time in his presence. You got to spend time giving back to him his promises and returning to him his word. Let me keep going. That makes some people nervous. You got to learn God's word so you can hear his voice. Now, I want to specifically, and I feel like God wants to help somebody today. Uh, I want to say this in the context of provision. I'm not going to read it for sake of time, but in 1 Kings 17, uh, we are introduced to Elisha. And Elisha uh, uh, is real bold, and he's tired of the idolatry in Israel. And so he says... Uh, according to the God I serve, as surely as he lives, there will be no more rain or dew for the next few years until I give the word. And so the problem is, when he said that, that meant it was going to compromise him. And so he needed water as well. Remember, Israel is a very dry, arid country. And so long story shorter, the Lord directs him to a brook where he can find drink. And he says, there I have commanded ravens to bring you food. Later on, the brook dried up, and the Lord said, I've commanded you to go to Zarephath because there's a widow that's going to take care of you. My point is, we have to become familiar with the promises of God. We have to become familiar with the word of God. We've got to know his word so that we can discern his voice. Do you realize your provision is on the other side of you being able to hear his voice? If you can't you don't know the word, if you don't know his promises, you won't be able to discern when it's him speaking. Number three, obey the Lord even when it doesn't make sense. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10 in the Living Bible, it says, Abraham trusted God. And when God told him to leave home and go far away to another land that he promised to give him, Abraham obeyed. Away he went, not even knowing where he was going. 
And when, even when he reached God's promised land, he lived in tents like a mere visitor, as did Isaac and Jacob, to whom God gave the same promise. Abraham did this because he was confidently waiting for God to bring him to that strong heavenly city whose designer and builder is God. Now, in most of our translations, you will read the phrase, by faith. Isn't that right? Yes. By faith. Yeah. That word faith in the Hebrew is immuna. It comes from the root word aman, which means firm or solid. This is also where we get the word amen from. Glory. So for all my hieroglyphic uh, Kemet folks, it didn't come from Amen, the Egyptian God. For some people, that don't matter, but there's some folks in the room. You've been tempted with syncretism and blending religious perceptions and philosophies that come from different places. You can't mix everything with the Word of God. But this is what they believe. They believe that, 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 that somehow uh, what we have as the faith in the Hebrew, uh, from the Hebrews, has been, is really Egyptology in a different form. And when we say amen, it's actually us praising the sun god, Ra Aman. And that's not the case. This is the root word for amen, Aman, which means firm or solid. Immuna is a solid or firm belief in the Lord God and his word. This has to deal with not only a cognitive or intellectual knowing, but also loyalty. This has to deal with our thinking and our acting. Therefore, faith means that one is loyal to the Lord, that they are faithful to his word and obedient to his commands. Say, I'm loyal, I'm faithful, and obedient. Loyal, faithful, and obedient. The just shall live by faith. In other words, when God gives us direction, we say amen, and we do it. By faith can also be translated in the uh, complete Jewish Bible. I love how it says it here. It says, Abraham, by trusting rather, Abraham went. By trusting, Moses uh, forsook Egypt. Uh, by trusting, by trusting, by trusting. So in other words, trust that God is faithful, trust that God is good, and trust that he loves you. That's how you're going to be able to engage his purpose for your life. You got to trust him. As a matter of fact, Hebrews 11:6 in the complete Jewish Bible says it like this, and without trusting, it is impossible to be well-pleasing to God. Because whoever approaches him must trust that he does exist and that he becomes a rewarder to those who seek him out. You got to trust him. You got to trust him. My last slide. It's a summation. Three keys to engaging your purpose. I'll repeat them for the last time. Dedicate time to spend with the Lord. Two, learn the word of God so you can discern his voice. And three, obey the Lord even when it doesn't make sense. I recall in 2008, the Lord gave my wife and I a prophetic word. And part of it, the messenger said by the spirit of the Lord, he says, I never told you that it would make sense. I told you to trust me. And you'll see the end of the thing. So for everybody that's trying to make sense out of what's going on in your life, if you are in the will of God, now I say if as a preposition because some of us, we are experiencing outcomes that are the result of us not obeying God. So there's consequences for disobedience. But when you know you've done what God has given you to do, you have to trust that he knows where he's taking you. Amen. In summary... The summation of all that we've shared today. Remember, the Lord is sovereign and has a plan for our lives. Remember that our destiny, and I'll use that term loosely, is to be like Jesus in this world. Number three, discipleship. The call to follow the Lord God will test our deepest loyalties. And lastly, the Lord's faithfulness, goodness, and love provide the foundation for trusting him. His goodness, his faithfulness, and his love provide the foundation for trusting him.
When it doesn't make sense, Lord, I'll go. When it doesn't make sense, Lord, I'll follow. When it's super uncomfortable, God, I'll stay. Jesus told the parable of the man who built this house. The two men, one built the house on rock, the other on sand. And he uses this term, he says, when the wind blew, when the rain began to fall, when the floods began to break against that house, the one who built this house upon the rock, that house remained. And the one who built the house on the sand, that house collapsed. When we trust in God, it's a foundation that includes his faithfulness, his goodness, and his love. What's your foundation today? Are you trusting him? Will you trust him to take you where he wants you to go? Will you trust him to mold you so that you can be everything he created you to be? Will you trust him to remove from your life and to insert in your life the people and the things that are necessary for you to fulfill his purpose for your life. Everyone is standing. We've had a great time at the altar, whether it was here in the front or at our seats, or even for those of you who are watching by by way of streaming services right now. But before we dismiss, I just want you to close your eyes one more time and reflect for a moment where you are July 7th, 2024. God's not done with you. There's more he has for you. Some of you are right on the cusp of a tremendous breakthrough. Some of you might feel like I'm starting over. What was once my normal and my usual has suddenly been shifted. But no matter where you are, understand that God loves you. He sees you and he knows just what to do. And so, Father, upon the hearing of those words, we declare out of our own mouths, we will trust you. Come on, if you are in agreement with that, regardless of how it feels, Lord, I trust you. Thank you for your leadership in my life. Thank you for the power of your presence, your faithful promises, and we thank you that your spirit is a comforter in the midst of the process. Lord, help us to hold on. Help us to stay true. Help us to not run or flee or leave the things that you've not called us to run from, to flee from or leave, but also, God, help us to have the courage to retreat, to flee, if that's what you're calling for. Help us to discern the difference, God. Help us to embrace your will for our lives. Now, Father, as we depart from this place, we do so, Lord, but never your presence. May your hand be upon us. May you smile upon us. May you be gracious to us. And may your mercy be multiplied in our lives. God, we speak freedom over our families. We speak freedom and salvation, Lord, healing and deliverance over our relatives, our spouses, our children. May you get the glory in their lives. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday. And we hope to see you this week for prayer.